we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Meditation means the emptying of consciousness of its content. Then only can the mind be absolutely quiet. Hello and welcome to episode 88 of Urgency of Change. Each weekly episode in this season of the Krishnamurti podcast is based on a major theme of the philosopher's talks, such as freedom, self-knowledge, beauty, intelligence and authority. Extracts from our archives have been carefully selected to represent Krishnamurti's different approaches to each of these universal and timelessly relevant themes. This week's theme is meditation. Upcoming themes are individuality, peace and ambition. This podcast is brought to you by Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Please see our official YouTube channel, for hundreds of video and audio recordings of Krishnamurti's full talks and shorter extracts. We are a non-profit charity and rely on your support to continue to preserve and make Krishnamurti's work available. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. This week's episode on meditation has four sections. The first extract is from Krishnamurti's fourth talk in San Diego, 1970, titled, What is Meditation? Then what is meditation? First of all, the mind, this mind that chatters, that projects ideas, that has contradiction, that lives in constant conflict, in comparison, that mind must obviously be very quiet, mustn't it? To observe, that mind must be extraordinarily quiet, right? If I am to listen to what you are saying, I must give attention to what you are saying. I can't be chattering. I can't be thinking about something else. I mustn't compare with what you are saying with what I already know. I must actually, completely listen to you. That means the mind must be attentive, must be silent, must be quiet. Mustn't it? Huh? Therefore, seeing the necessity that to observe, clearly the mind must be quiet. Right? To see clearly the mind must be quiet. And because It is imperative to see violence, to see clearly the whole structure of violence, and therefore to look at it, you must, the mind must be completely still. Therefore, you have a still mind. I don't know if you have followed it. You don't have to cultivate a still mind. Right, sir? Because to cultivate a still mind implies the one who is to one who cultivates in the field of of time that which he hopes to achieve. 
See all that what I have just now said. See the difficulty. Because all the people who try to teach meditation, they say, control your mind. Your mind must be absolutely quiet. And you try to control it and so everlastingly battle with it and spend forty years controlling it, which is completely silly. Because any schoolboy can control, can concentrate. Control. We are not saying that at all. We are saying on the contrary. The mind that observes, please do listen to this, that observes, doesn't analyze, is not seeking experience, merely observes, must be free from all noise. And therefore, the mind becomes completely quiet. If I am to listen to you, I must listen to you. Not translate what you are saying or interpret what you are saying to suit myself or to condemn you, condemn you or to judge you. I must listen. So that very act of listening is attention which need not be practiced at all. If you practice it, you've already become inattentive. Are you following all this? So when you are attentive and your mind wanders off, which indicates it is inattentive, let it wander off and know that it is inattentive and the very awareness of that inattention is attention. Don't battle with inattention. Don't try to say, I must be attentive, which is childish. Know that you are inattentive. Be aware, choicelessly, that you are inattentive. What of it? But the moment in that inattention there is action, be aware of that action. You understand all this? Really, sirs, it is so terribly simple. No, if you do it, uh, theoretically it becomes simple, it has no value. But if you do it, it becomes so clear, so simple clear as the waters, that, <laughs> no, I won't go for it, for it. <laughs> So, silence of the mind is the beauty of itself, is the beauty in itself to listen to the bird, to the voice of a human being, to the politician, to the priest, to all the noise of propaganda that goes on, to listen completely silently. And then you hear much more, you see much more. Now, that silence is not possible if your body, the organism, is not also completely still. You understand? Mm. If your body, the organ, with all its nervous responses, all the fidgeting, 
the ceaseless movement of fingers, the eyes, you know, you know, the restlessness of the body. That must be completely still. Have you ever tried sitting completely still without a single movement of the body, including the eyes? Do it sometime and you will see. You may do it for five minutes or two minutes, that's good enough. Don't say, how am I to keep it for ten minutes, for an hour? Don't. That's greed. (laughs) To do it for two minutes is enough. And that two, in that two minutes, The whole of this thing is revealed, if you know how to look. So the body must be still, because then the flow of the blood to the head becomes more, right? If you sit crouched, hmm, sloppy, then it is more difficult for the blood to go to the head. You know all this. So either lie down or sit still, sit, do anything. You can meditate in the bus. When you are driving, that's the most... If you are driving, it's the most extraordinary thing, you know, that you can meditate while you're driving. Only be, aw- be awfully careful. <laughs> no, no, I really mean this. Which means the body has its own intelligence, which the mind has spoiled, thought has destroyed. Thought seeks pleasure. Therefore, tasty foods, you follow? Overeating, indulging, sexually in all the ways, compelling the body to do certain things. If it is lazy, force it not to be lazy, or take a pill to keep awake. That way you are destroying the the innate intelligence of the organism. And when you do that, the organism becomes insensitive. And so you need great sensitivity. Therefore, one has to watch what one eats. All that. I won't go into all that business. It's up to you. Because if you overeat, you know what happens. You know. All the ugliness of all that. So you need a body that is highly sensitive, greatly intelligent. And therefore, love which doesn't become pleasure love then is enjoyment. It is joy. Pleasure has always a motive. Joy has none. It is timeless. You can't say, I am joyous. The moment you have said it, it's gone. Or if you seek the cause of that joy, you want it repeated. 
and no, therefore no longer joy. So that these three things are central. The, the intelligence of the body, the capacity, the fullness of love without the distortions of pleasure, which doesn't mean that they are not pleasure, but which doesn't distort the mind. Look, you know, most of us have pain, physical pain, in some form or another. And that pain generally distorts the mind. Doesn't it? I wish I hadn't it. I wish I were better. You know, spends year, um, days thinking about it. So, when the body has pain, to watch it, to observe it. And not let it interfere with the mind. The second extract is from the seventh talk in Sanan, 1974, titled The Controller is the Controlled. When we go into this question of meditation, please look at it as though you have never heard the word or the meaning of that word or anything about it. But unfortunately you can't do that because you have a lot of gurus, sannyasis, swamis, and all the rest of that gang that come to this country or to America to teach you how to meditate. How to sit properly, how to breathe, and how to concentrate, and all the rest of it. So what is meditation? Not how to meditate, that's irrelevant. The moment you understand what is meditation, it naturally happens. Like breathing. You, na- you don't, you breathe naturally. So you have to find out what is meditation. Right? Can you learn from another? Can you learn from another what is the real meaning of meditation? Volumes have been written about it. People have meditated according to a particular system, Zen, or the Hindu systems of many, many varieties and models and methods of system. The content of all those implies an end to be achieved through control, right? Control implies a controller. Please follow this little bit. And is the controller different from the control? You understand the question? They say the whole meditative groups and their systems and their philosophies, their breathing, they say control your thought. Because thought wanders about. And the wandering about is a wastage of energy. Therefore, thought must be absolutely held, disciplined, subjugated in the pursuit of that thing, enlightenment, God, truth, what you will. 
Jehovah, the nameless, all that. That implies a controller, obviously, right? And who is the controller? Is he different in quality, in nature, from that which he says he is going to control? You are following all this? Please, this very important to understand this, because the speaker wants to point out that one can live completely in daily life without any control against all the traditions. You understand? Against all your education, your social model behavior. So he says, live a life without absolutely no control. But that means you have to understand very, very deeply who is the controller and the controlled. And this part of meditation. Is the controller different from that which he is controlling, which is thought? Some say the controller is different. He is the higher self. Please listen to all this. He is the higher self. He is the part of higher consciousness. He is the essence of understanding, the essence of the past which has accumulated so much knowledge. So, they, the whole traditional and the gurus and the swamis, the yogis, all of them say, control. Right? They have never asked who is the controller. They may have asked it, but they have translated, yes, the controller is the Supreme Self which is still within the field of thought. However much thought may be elevated, it is still within the area of time, measure, which is thought. Right? Do please see this. See the truth of this. Not the verbal acceptance of it or the intellectual comprehension of it, but the truth of the matter that all the gods, Christian gods and the Hindu, all of them are the invention of thought. And thought can project itself into all kinds of states, into all kinds of illusions. And when thought says there is the higher self, it is still within the field of thought. Therefore, the higher self is still matter. I wonder if you get this. So, controller is the controlled. Right? Do see this. Therefore, the whole aspect of meditation changes. You and what is the meaning of meditation? The meaning of meditation is Objectively, not my personal opinion, judgment, evaluation, dogma, experience, none of that. Meditation means the emptying of consciousness of its content. Then only 
can the mind and the brain be absolutely quiet? That absolute, not relative, absolute quietness is necessary to observe, not to experience. Right? Please see all this. Most of us want experience. Experience, which we've had, sensory experiences, sexual, every kind of experience we've had, and thought desires more experiences, an experience of another state, of another dimension, right? Because we are fed up with this world and its experience. They are boring. They have a limitation. They are confined, narrow. And we want an experience which is totally different. Right? Now, to, to experience involves recognition. Right? You are following? If I don't recognize, is there an experience? Hmm? I've had the experience of looking at a mount, the beauty of it, the shadows, the lovely deep blue of an early morning, the whole sense of something extraordinary, magnificent. And that experience cannot exist if there is no relationship to the past. Right? So, experience implies recognition from the past. Obviously, it's so simple. Hmm? So, I want to, mind wants to experience something supreme. And to recognize it, you must have already had it. Therefore, it is not the Supreme. You understand? It is still the projection of the mind, of thought. So meditation is a... a meditation in which there is no experience. Follow that. Because in that there is no element of time. Am I, are we meeting each other? As we said, time implies movement and direction. When the direction implies will, and can the mind empty itself of time and direction and movement, which is the ending of hope. That is the whole problem. You understand? Are we following each other? Or is there still verbal description and you're just enjoying the speaker's delight in talking about meditation? We are asking, what is meditation? We said, 
It is the emptying of the mind of the known. Emptying of the mind of its content as consciousness with all its accumulation. And whether that is possible. Right? Because we need <coughs> knowledge to function. To speak any language you need knowledge. To ride a car you need a knowledge. To do anything you need knowledge. And what place has knowledge in meditation? Or it has no place at all. It has no place, because if it is merely a continuation of the past, right, it is still the movement of time, the movement of the past, and so on. Have you understood? So can the mind empty itself of the past and come upon that area of the mind which is not touched by thought. You understood the problem, my question? See, we have only operated so far within the area of thought as knowledge. Right? Is there any other part, any other area of the mind, which includes the brain, which is not touched by human struggle, pain, anxiety, fear, the, all the violence, all the things that man has made through thought, right? And the discovery of that area is meditation. You know, that implies can thought come to an end, but yet thought operate when necessary in the field of knowledge. You understand my question? Please understand this question. Pay a little attention, you may be tired, but just give your little attention to it. We need knowledge, otherwise you can't function, you can't go home, you won't be able to speak, you won't be able to write, and so on. Knowledge is necessary to function, and that functioning becomes neurotic, that function assume becomes uh, that out of the function status becomes all important, which is the entering of thought as the me, which is status. Right? So knowledge is necessary. And the meditation is the is to discover or come upon or to observe an area in which there is no movement of thought. And can the two live together harmoniously daily in all? That is the problem. Not breathing, you understand? Not sitting straight, not repeating mantras, you know, slogans, paying hundred dollars or whatever you pay in order to learn some ugly little word and repeat that and you think you are in heaven, which is called transcendental nonsense. <laughs> and that is the whole problem of yoga practicing yoga, standing on your head and proficiency in yoga and all the rest of it. It must have originally 
have, must have had a totally different meaning. The word yoga means to join, to join the higher and the lower. You follow? And that was what we have, but it must have had quite a different meaning. Because who is it that has divided the two and who is it that joins them together? You follow? It is still thought. Right? And there are. So, yoga exercise is excellent, one must do it, I do it. The speaker does it every day, for an hour or more. But that's merely a physical exercise of a different kind, to keep the body healthy, breathing and so on. But through that you can never come upon the other. Never. Because if you give that, give to that all importance, then you are not giving importance to the understanding of yourself, which is to be watchful, to be aware, to give attention to what you are doing every day of your life. How you speak, what you say, what you think, how you behave, whether you are attached, whether you are frightened, whether you are pursuing pleasure, and so on to be aware of this whole movement of thought. If you are, and if you are really serious about it, then you will have established right relationship, obviously. You understand? You know, relationship becomes extraordinarily important when, this, when all things about you become chaotic. When the world is going to pieces as it is, relationship becomes extraordinarily important. There you seek security, you want to hold on to that one thing that is possibly can give you complete sense of unity and all the rest of it. Right? So, unless there is this establishment between you and another of total relationship, that means a world relationship, not between you and me, but human relationship with the whole of the world, then you have, that is the basis from there you can go on to behavior, how you behave. If your behavior is, has a motive, then it's not behavior. If your behavior is based on pleasure or on reward, it is not behavior. It's merely the pursuit of pleasure or fear. Not the pursuit of fear, fear arises. So. Relationship, behavior, and order. These are absolutely essential if you want to go into the question of meditation. If you have not laid this foundation, then you can do what you like, stand on your head, breathe in for the rest next 10,000 years and repeat words, words, there will be no meditation. You can even go to India if you have the money. <laughs> I don't know why you go to India. You will find no enlightenment there. Enlightenment is where you are. And where you are, you have to understand yourself. Uh, having established that, laid the foundation there, order, not mechanical order, because order is virtue. From moment to moment, it's not following a pattern, it's not the order of the establishment, it's not the order or the virtue of society, which is immoral. So, 
order, behavior and relationship. Then you can go into the question of finding out what is meditation. Meditation implies a quality of mind that is absolutely silent, not made silent, not contrived act, not brought about through will, but a silence that comes naturally when you have established all our relationship and behavior. And silence is necessary, because otherwise you can't see, right? Please see this. If my mind is chattering, as most minds are, in the chatter there may be a period of silence, between two chattering, there might be a period of silence, but that's not silence. Silence is not the absence of noise. Silence is not the absence of conflict. Silence comes only when the content of your consciousness has been completely understood and gone beyond which means the observer and the observed are one. And when there is no controller, please listen to this, when there is no controller, it doesn't mean that you live a life of undiscipline, but it, when there is no observer, no controller, action then is instantaneous which brings a great deal of energy. The third extract is from Krishnamurti's sixth talk in Ojai, 1949, titled Meditation is the Beginning of Self-Knowledge. Because meditation has a great deal of significance. It may be the door to real self-knowledge. And it may open the door to reality. And in opening the door and experiencing it directly, then there is a possibility of understanding life, which is relationship. So meditation, the right kind of meditation, is essential. So let us find out what is right kind of meditation. And to find out what is right, we must approach it negatively. <coughs> Merely to say, this is right meditation, will give you only a pattern which you will adopt, practice, and that will not be right meditation. So as I am talking about it, please follow me and experience it as we go along together. Because there are different types of meditation. I do not know if any of you have practiced them, or have indulged in them, gone away by yourself in a locked room, sat in a dark corner, and so on, so on. So, let us examine the whole process of what we call meditation. First of all, let us take the meditation in which discipline is involved. Any form of discipline only strengthens the self.
and the self is the source of contention, conflict. That is, if we discipline ourselves to be something, to be, as so many people do, this month I am going to be kind. I am going to practice kindliness. Such a discipline, such practice, is bound to strengthen the me. You may be outwardly kind, but surely a man who practices kindliness and is conscious of his kindliness is not kind. So that form of meditation, which people call also meditation, is obviously not the right kind. Because as we discussed yesterday, <coughs> if you practice something, in that the mind is caught, and in that there is no freedom. But since most of us desire to acquire a result, that is, to be kind at the end of the month, or the end of a certain period, because ultimately teachers have said you must be kind in order to find God. And your desire is to find God as the ultimate source of your security and happiness, so you buy God through kindness. which is obviously the strengthening of the me and the mind, which is a self-enclosing process. And anything that encloses, any action that is binding can never give freedom. Surely that is obvious. Perhaps we can discuss it another time, it's not clear. <laughs> then there is this whole process of concentration. which is also called meditation. You sit in a cross leg, because that's the fashion from India, or in a chair, in a dark room, in front of a picture or an image, and trying to concentrate on a word, on a phrase, or a mental image, and exclude all other thoughts. I'm sure many of you have done this. And the other thoughts keep pouring in, and you push them out, and you keep on with the struggle, till you are able to concentrate at the exclusion, and exclude everything else. Then you feel gratified. At last you have learned to fix your mind on a point which you think is essential. Again, through exclusion do you find anything? Through exclusion, suppression, denial, can the mind be quiet? Because as I said, there can be understanding only when the mind is really quiet, not suppressed, not so concentrated on an idea that is a, it becomes exclusive. Whether it's a master or some virtue or what you will. Through concentration, fixation, the mind can never be quiet. Superficially, at the higher levels of consciousness, you may produce and for enforce stillness. Make your body perfectly still, your mind very quiet, superficially. But that surely is not the quietness of your whole being.
So again, that is not meditation. That's merely a compulsion, putting on the brake. Constant. When the engine wants to run full speed, you soften it, you put on the brake. Why I, if you are able to examine every inch, every thought that comes into your being, into your mind, go into it fully, completely think every thought out. Then there will be no wandering of the mind, because the mind has found the values of each thought. Therefore it's no longer attractive, which means there is no distraction. A mind that is capable of being distracted and resists distraction is not capable of meditation. Because what is distraction? I hope you are experimenting with what I am saying, experiencing as I am talking to find out the truth of all this matter. It is the truth that liberates, not my words and your opinion. We call distraction any movement away from that in which we think we should be So you choose a particular interest, so-called noble interest, and fix your mind on it. But any movement away from it is a distraction. So you resist distraction. But what makes you choose that one particular interest? Obviously, because it's gratifying, because it gives you a sense of security, a sense of fullness, a sense of otherness. So you say, I must fix my mind on that. And any movement away from it is a distraction. So you spend your life in battle against distraction and fix your mind on something else. Whereas if you examine every distraction and not merely fix your mind on a particular attraction, then you will see the mind is no longer capable of being distracted because it has understood the whole distractions as well as the attraction. Therefore the mind is capable of extraordinary extensive awareness without exclusion. So concentration is not meditation. And disciplining is not meditation. Then there are Fair. This whole problem of praying of and receiving. That's also called meditation. What do we mean by pray? Pray. Supplication, the gross form of it. And there are subtle forms at different levels of prayer. The gross form we, we all know. I'm in trouble, I'm in misery, physically or psychologically I want some help. So I go, I beg, I supply, sub, supply. And obviously there's an answer. If there was no answer people wouldn't pray. Millions pray. You only pray when you are in trouble, not when you are happy, not when there is that extraordinary sense of otherness. Now what happens when you pray?
You have a formula, haven't you? By repetition of a formula, the superficial mind becomes quiet, doesn't it? You try it and you will see. By repeat a certain phrase or phrases or words, and gradually you'll see your whole being becomes quiet. That is, your superficial consciousness is calm. And then in that state it is able to receive, isn't it, the intimations of something else. So, through calming the mind by a repetitive word, by a repetition, by so-called prayer, you may receive hints and intimations from not only the subconscious, from about you. But surely that is not meditation. Because what you receive must be gratifying, otherwise you will reject it. So your desire, when you pray to, and thereby quieting the mind, is the result of the desire to solve a particular problem or a confusion or something which you have not solved, which gives you pain. Therefore you are seeking an answer which will be gratified. And reverse to that also is because you say, I mustn't seek gratification, I will be open to something which will be painful. The mind is so capable of playing tricks upon itself. That one must be aware of the whole content of this question of prayer. So again that is not meditation, is it? One has learned a trick, how to quieten the mind which it can receive certain answers, pleasurable or not pleasurable. But that's not meditation, is it? And this question of devotion to somebody, pouring out your love to God, to any man, to some saint, to some master, Is that meditation? Why do you pour out your love to God? That which you cannot possibly know Why are we so attracted to the unknown and give our lives, our, our beings to that? This whole question of devotion, does it not indicate that being so miserable in our own lives, having no right relationship with other human beings. We try to project ourselves into something, into the unknown, and worship the unknown. You know those people who, who are devoted to somebody, to some god, to some image, to some master, are the generally most cruel people, obstinate. They are intolerant of others. They are willing to destroy others verbally as well as physically, because they, they have so identified themselves with that image, with that master, with that experience. So again, the outpouring of devotion to an object self-created or created by another, is surely not meditation. 
So what is meditation? If none of these things are meditation, discipline, concentration, prayer, devotion, then what is meditation? Those are the forms which we know, with, with which we are familiar. But to find out that which is not, with which we are not familiar, we have to be free of these things of which we are familiar, haven't we, first. If this is not true, then they must be set aside. Then only you are capable of finding out what is right meditation, or isn't it? If we have been accustomed to the false value, to find out the new value, the old values must be, must they not? Not because I say so, because you think it out, feel it out. Therefore, if, if, if it is not these and they have gone, what have they left? What is the residue of your examination of these things? Do they not reveal the process of your own thinking? Surely, if you have indulged in these things and you see that they are false, you find out why, why you have indulged them. And therefore, the very examination of these things reveal the way of your own thinking. Therefore, the examination of these is the beginning of self-knowledge, is it not? So, meditation is the beginning of self-knowledge. Without self-knowledge you may sit in a corner, meditate on the masters, develop virtues, they are illusions. And they have no meaning for the person who really wants to discover what is right meditation. Because without self-knowledge you will project yourself, self, an image. Call it the master. And that becomes your object of devotion. For which you are willing to sacrifice, build, destroy. Therefore, through self-knowledge, and you can have there is possibility of self-knowledge only as we examine our relationship to these things which I have explained. Then it reveals the process of your own thinking. Therefore there is a clarity in your own being. And therefore there is the beginning and the understanding of self-knowledge. Without self-knowledge there can be no meditation. And without meditation there can be no self-knowledge. Not shutting yourself up in a corner, sitting in front of a picture, developing virtues, by month by month, different virtues each month, green, purple, white and all the rest of it. Or going to churches and performing ceremonies. None of those things are medit meditation or really spiritual life. Spiritual life begins in the understanding of relationship, which is the beginning of self-knowledge. 
Now, when you have gone through that and have abandoned all those processes which only reveal the self and its activities, then there is a possibility of the mind not only being superficially quiet, but inwardly quiet. Thus all, there is the cessation of all demands. There is no pursuit of sensation. There is no sense of becoming, myself becoming something, in the future or tomorrow. The master, the initiate, the pupil, the Buddha, the, you know, climbing the ladder of success, becoming something. All that has stopped, because all that is implied in the process of becoming. And that becomes, there is a cessation of becoming only when there is the understanding of what is. And the understanding of what is, is shown through self-knowledge, what one is exactly. And then, when there is the cessation of all desire, it can only come through self-knowledge. Then the mind is quiet. The cessation of desire cannot come through compulsion, through prayer, through devotion, through concentration. All these merely emphasize the conflict of desire and the opposite. And when there is a cessation of all this, then the mind is really still. Not only the superficial mind, the higher levels of the mind, but inwardly, deeply. Then only is it possible for it to receive that which is immeasurable. The understanding of all this is meditation, not just one part of it. Because if we do not know how to meditate, we will not know how to act. Action of all is self-knowledge, in relationship. And merely to shut yourself in a sacred room with incense burning, reading phrases of other people's meditations and their significance is utterly useless has no meaning. It's a marvelous escape. But to be aware of all this human activity, which is ourselves, the desire to be, to attain, the desire to conquer, the desire to have certain virtue, all emphasizing the me as important, in the now or in the future, this becoming of the me, being aware of all that in its totality is the beginning of self-knowledge and the beginning of meditation. Then you will see, if you are really aware of this, there comes a marvelous transformation. Which isn't a verbal expression which isn't a verbalization, merely repetition, which is sensation, but actual, actually, really, vigorously that takes place. A thing which cannot be made, which cannot be termed. And that is not the gift of the few, not the gift of the masters of few people have it. Because self-knowledge is possible for everybody. If you are willing to experiment, try. 
don't have to join any society and read any book or be at the feet of any master. The self-knowledge liberates you from all that, from all that absurdity, stupidities of human inventions. And then only through self-knowledge and right meditation there is freedom. In that freedom there comes reality. But you cannot have reality through mental process. It must come to you. And it can only come to you when there is freedom from desire. The final extract this week is from a direct recording by Krishnamurti in 1983 titled, Meditation is Without Measurement. To live without any kind of measurement, inwardly, never to compare what you are to what you should be. The word meditation is not only to ponder, to think over, to probe, to look, to weigh and all that, but also it has much deeper meaning. As in Sanskrit, the word means to measure, which is to become. And in meditation there must be no measurement. And this meditation must be not a conscious meditation, a deliberate and chosen posture, deliberate chosen posture, but Meditation can never be a conscious meditation. It must be totally unconscious. Never knowing that you are meditating. If you deliberately meditate, it's another form of desire, as any other expressions of desire. The objects may vary. Your meditation may be to reach the highest, but the motive is the desire to achieve as the businessman. Meditation is a movement without any motive, without will, and the activity of thought. So there must be, it must be something that's not deliberately set about. Only then that meditation becomes, is a movement in the infinite, measureless to man, without a goal, without an end and without a beginning. And that has a strange action in daily life. For all life is one. When life it becomes sacred, and that which is sacred can never be killed. Kill another is unholy. The cries to heaven is a bird kept in a cage. One never realizes how sacred life is. Not only your little life, but the lives of millions of others. 
him the most from the things of nature and to extraordinary human beings. And meditation, she is without measurement, then is the very action of that which is most noble, most sacred and holy. The other day, on the banks of the river, How lovely are rivers. There isn't only one sacred river. All rivers throughout the world are, have their own divinity. And the other day, a man was sitting on the banks of a river, wrapped in a fawn-colored cloth. His hands were hidden. His eyes were sh shut and his body was very still. He had beads in his hands and he was repeating some words and the hands were moving from bead to bead. He had done it for so many years and he never missed a be bead. And the river deep rolled along what is beside him. His current was deep. And it began in the great, among the great mountains, snow clad and distant. And the river began on a, on a small stream. And as it moved south, it gathered other small streams and rivers and became a great river that this, in this part of the world they worshipped. And this man has been repeating his mantra and rolling the beads, for I do not, one does not know for how many years. And he was meditating. At least, people thought he was meditating. And probably he did too. So as every passerby looked at him, became silent, and went on with their laughter and chatter. That still figure, the only almost motionless fingers, one could see only the, through the cloth, the slight action of the fingers. He sat there for, for a very long time completely absorbed, for he heard no other sound except the sound of his own words and the rhythm of it, the music of it. And he would say that he was meditating. There are thousand others like him all over the world, in the quiet, deep monasteries, among the hills and towns, and beside the rivers. Meditation is not words, a mantra. All self-hypnotism, the drug of illusions. It must happen 
without your volition, it must take place in the quiet stillness of the night, when you suddenly awake and see that the brain is quiet and there is a peculiar quality of meditation going on. It must take place as silently as a snake among the gra- among the le- among the tall grass, green in the fresh morning light. must take place in the deep recesses of the brain. Meditation is not an achievement. There is no method, style, system or practice. Meditation begins with the ending of comparison, the becoming or not become, as the breeze whispers among the leaves. So the whispering of meditation is active.